Welcome, everyone. It's really wonderful to see you here tonight. Um, and uh, as you as you noted, we are recording this session. Um, my name is Nikki Lefebvre, and I'm the director of the Natick Historical Society. We were established in 1870, and today we remain an independent nonprofit uh, that uh, receives no public funds, and we thrive on the support of our community members. And so I want to extend my thanks to all of you um, for making programs like these possible. Uh, thank you so much. And we're delighted to have with us tonight, Doug Drenick of, um, he's the chair of the forest, the Trails and Forest Stewardship Committee. And I will properly introduce him uh, in a few moments. But first I want to note that this program is part of our Meet Our Neighbors series, which aims to shine a light on uh, 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 local organizations that have shaped Natick in the past, present and future. And if you want to see some of the other Meet Our Neighbors conversations that we've had um, over the past couple of years, you can check out our YouTube channel uh, where you'll find features on TCAN and Broadmoor and the Morse Institute Library, the Natick Outdoor Store and other institutions and organizations that you know and love uh, right here in Natick. Um, I'm happy to share with you the news that the Natick History Museum, uh, which is in the garden level of the Big and Free Library, has reopened. And we are open on Tuesday evenings from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m., Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and the first and third Sunday of every month. We are also open by appointment on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So do come by and uh, check out an exhibit or make an appointment to do some research. Uh, we'd love to see you. We also have a few wonderful events coming up, so I want to mention those. Uh, on June 3rd, we have the Walnut Hill Walking Tour. Um, on June 4th, we have an Old Town Tour of uh, South Natick Center. And uh, and also on June 4th, at a different time, we have a talk on uh, Natick during King Philip's War. And all of these events are free and open to the public, and you can register for them on our website, www.natickhistoricalsociety.org. I'm also excited to announce that on Monday, June 19th, uh, that is the Juneteenth holiday, we are teaming up with Natick for Black Lives Matter to host a community reading of Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And uh, historian and Natick resident uh, Brennan Greer will give introductory remarks and then facilitate some dialogue afterwards. Um, Please note that you do not have to read yourself. You can come and listen and enjoy and uh, and and sort of soak in the speech um, and watch as your neighbors and friends uh, from the community might be readers. Uh, more information on that can also be found on our website. Uh, Without further ado, let me uh, welcome Doug Drenick. Um, Doug currently serves as the chair of the Trails and Forest Stewardship Committee. Uh, he also serves as the vice chair of the Open Space Advisory Committee uh, here in Natick. And uh, he is a member of the New Hampshire 4,000 Footer Club, which um, is an impressive feat. And so, <laughs> Doug, if we have a chance, you'll have to tell us a little bit about that. Um, and he is a basketball coach for the Newton Celtics which is a Special Olympics basketball team. Um, so um, in addition to all of that, he has a day job, right? And he's been with Fidelity Investments for about 30 years. Um, I don't know how he manages all of this, but he does. And uh, we'll hear about a sliver of all of that wonderful work tonight um, uh, in relation to the Trails and Forest Stewardship com uh, Committee. And let's give uh, our speaker a warm but silent Zoom round of applause. Doug. Thanks so much. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Terry, for having me. It's uh, it's exciting to be here and uh, talk to everybody. Let me share my screen real quick. I've got a presentation to keep me on track here. Um, so again, my name is Doug Drenick. I'm um, thrilled to be here tonight in this polarized world. It is really, I think, exciting to talk about something that isn't polarizing at all, and that is the preservation of open space and the maintenance of the trails on those open spaces. Um, if you don't know, Natick has a lot of open space and it has a lot of trails. And for the longest time, I, I sat on the open space committee um, and there wasn't really ownership of who maintained those trails. And in 2019, um, the, the Conservation Committee decided to create the Trails and Forest Stewardship Committee. And so I've been on that committee since day one. It's a committee of nine people. 
We meet the first Monday of every month. We post the agendas out on the town website. We love to have others come and join us and hear input. I'll give you some contact information at the end of this, um, but it's a very open and committee. And like I said, we encourage people to, to come in and join and, and make sure we're listening to their feedback as we go about some of these bigger tasks. This is the agenda I'll be running through tonight. So what I, what I plan to do is talk about the trail priorities for this year. Um, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into two parcels of town land that we have a lot going on at, and that's Town Forest and Pickerel Pond. I'll then go into our wish list. We have a wish list, as I'm sure everybody does, on what would we really want to have happen on the trails if we could only afford to do that. Well, I'll, I'll talk through some of those ideas. I'll give you my contact information at the end of this, and then happy to engage in any questions that, that you may have. So let's start with the trail priorities. So the, the, the trail priorities, what we and this is a learning experience. I'll be honest. Um, there is no uh, there's no class for trails maintenance uh, that you can take and understand how to to uh, effectively manage all of the trails in a trail system. So we're learning. And what one of the things we learned is from last year is we need to narrow our focus. We we went a little too broad with our goals. And so this, what you're seeing in front of you is a narrowed focus for our priorities for 2023. And the first thing it starts with is the trail steward program. So the trail steward program, we have volunteers. We have at least two people per trail in the town that have committed to going out and monitoring that trail, picking up trash, reporting any incidents at least twice a month. And that's really the heart and soul of the committee because that's the eyes and ears for us. So they're the ones that alert us when there's a trail, a tree down uh, on one of the trails or a big party scene or a fire burning or anything else that we need to be aware of. And so I'm happy to say that we've had great success with this program. Uh, we kicked it off two years ago now. Um, I was managing it at first and realized it was too much for me to manage effectively. And so now we have um, a volunteer named Mary Hudson who has taken over that responsibility here recently. But like I said, the, the trail steward program are our eyes and ears on the trail at all time. It's important obviously to maintain that and make sure that all the trails have that. Um, that person looking out for them. The next thing is restore the trailhead kiosks. If you look on the on the right hand side here, this is one of the kiosks that I'm talking about. We have about uh, we have eight of these throughout the town, and they're in various states of disrepair. Um, there were they were purchased in two different sets. So there's a set that's older, and there's a set that's newer. The older one is definitely in need of some attention. And so this is a welcoming part of our major trail systems. And so we want this to look better. And so the intention is some of the plexiglass out there on these is you can't even see through it anymore. Um, that we need to stain the woodwork. We need to get consistent signage behind the glass there. So we're gonna be prioritizing that early this summer um, in order to make sure that it looks nice it reads well and everybody has the information that they need. A lot of the things that we hear from are navigational type issues on the trails and some places are more confusing than others. And so we've blazed all of the trails, but even with the blazing, sometimes it is difficult. You can get spun around, especially in a, in a, a trail system like the town forest, I still get spun around there. And so what we're doing uh, this year, and you'll probably, you'll see some of these out there already, and there's a picture of it at the right, we're in, in adding uh, junction numbers on the trails. And then this will correspond with the map. And if you've ever been on a trustee's property, the trustees does a very nice job. And this is the way that you can orient yourself on, okay, I, I have the map, but where am I on the map? If you see one of these numbers, you would then be able to check your map 
and be able to identify where you are in that trail system and then get yourself out of it. Um, and then in addition to that, we're improving, we have a goal to improve the trailhead signage. If you look to the picture on the top right here, this is what I would like to refer to as sign blight. It's, um, I'm sure with the best intentions it was done, um, but each time there's a new warning or a new um, issue, another sign goes up. And so this to me does not scream welcome. And this is at the Oak Street entrance of the town forest, which is probably one of our busiest trailheads in the entire system. And so the goal is to combine all of this into one sign and have that sign at the, at the very top say, welcome to the town forest. Here are some rules to abide by and list them out and don't freak people out about no recreational vehicles and coyotes and ticks. All of this stuff is important, but it just seems to be a little uh, haphazard, I would say right now. And this is the same way at most of the trails that we've got out, uh, trailheads, I should say, out there. So the intention is to take all of those, condense it down into a welcoming sign that still gets the same information across, but um, actually would welcome you to that parcel and make sure that you um, understand where you are. The other thing is the Eagle Scout work. Um, we have a great relationship with the scouts, the local scouts, so there's two, troops in Natick and there's one troop in Wellesley that have done significant work for us. Last year alone, we had five Eagle Scout projects on the trails in Natick and it's a huge help to us. So when we, when we find a project that's bigger than maybe we can manage with a small team, we will review that with these candidates for Eagle Scout. And then most of them are very excited to do trail work. And so we'll take all of that labor that we can and organizational skills and they come and they present to us the idea to solve the problem that we presented to them. Sometimes they have to go out and get uh, approval from DCR or the CONCOM or any other number of agencies or um, agency um, and different bodies throughout um, the state. And so maintaining that relationship with those troops is important because they definitely help. In fact, last weekend they completed on the Eisenmanger Trail where it crosses right by Woodland Street, there was a boardwalk that was destroyed because of a tree came down on it. And they rebuilt that last weekend. Now people can get back on that um, boardwalk and uh, the homeowners association there is thrilled with the work that they did. So they, they really um, are a breath of fresh air for us and an excited uh, group of kids to, uh, to work with. Let me pause here for a second. Um, the Honeywell Town Forest is probably, it, it emotes the most enthusiasm of any parcel in Natick. And when we, when we put out a call for trail stewards, we get 10 times as many as we need volunteers for town force. In fact, we have some parcels that don't get any and we have to try to redirect them because everybody wants to be a, a trail steward at town forest. Uh, it's a beloved place. There's a lot of history there. Um, it, because this is a historical society um, presentation, I should mention that this is 1933. It was donated. It's 100 acres. And in 1934, 55, a natural science park was created there by some teachers at Lilja. And they used to take the kids down there as an outdoor experiential uh, lesson. Um, that is gone, but you can still see some of the, the um, signs from those days back then. Um, but it's got a long history with the town of Natick. And I think, um, it's a special place for sure. It, it, it definitely elicits um, a lot of a love and uh, appreciation 
amongst the uh, residents. If you don't know this about town forests, it is filled with invasives. And invasive species is one of the things that when we say uh, trails and forest stewardship, invasive species management is part of the forest stewardship plan. I'm thankful to have as vice chair on our committee, a botanist, and we have others who are just as educated on plants, invasives, this is not my strong suit for sure. So I rely on them completely to create this invasive management plan. And we've been at it now for three years. It's not something that you can just do and then move on to something else. It's continually monitoring the situation. I'll talk a little bit about the meadow in a second, but it, uh, the joke on our committee is it would probably be easier to mark the the native species than it is to mark the invasive species because that's how overgrown it is. And then once you once you become aware of what's an invasive species, it's almost like an obsession with me at least that I walk around going, oh my God, there's more invasives over there and there's more invasives over there. So um, it, it does sort of like uh, gnaw at you. And there'll be times we were out there the last few weekends in the meadow and uh, where you just can't leave because you see another patch of invasives between us and the committee and some volunteers, we also have the town. I should mention the conservation agent for Natick is Claire Rondelli. She is a close partner with us. Um, she is the our go-between between, between uh, our committee and the town. She's the one that will um, ensure that, so for example, with Town Forest, there is a um, outside vendor that comes in to do invasive treatments. Now they only do in certain invasives. So there's others that are still uh, still going strong. But like I said, it's a, it's a continual effort. And so we've got a plan. Uh, we've documented that plan. We've reviewed it with the CONCOM. They're on board with that and we will keep at it. This is another one where I said that sort of the scope can creep up on you. We're focused on town forest right now. It would be impossible for us to sort of broaden that to every parcel. And so the, the hope is we can get town forest under control uh, in a more manageable way. The other thing I'll mention about town forest is beavers. If you don't know, there are be resident beavers in town forest, and it's a controversial topic. And so let me show you, actually. Um, and by the way, this is a map that was done by a resident that's an artist. And Claire, they sent it to Claire, and they published it on social media. Everybody loved it. People want to buy it. So like this is, like I said, uh, the type of thing how I know people love town forest. If you walk in from here, and this is that entrance I was showing you the, um, the trailhead of, if you walk in here, right about here, oh, and actually she's got the beavers. I should, I should have noticed that. This is where the beaver dam is. And so the problem with the beaver dams is it floods the trails and it also affects the ponds, Little and Big Jennings Pond that are right there as well. And so we've had multiple community sessions. Uh, we have a vendor that uh, I'll talk about a beaver deceiver in a bit, but there, if you can believe it, there is a company that just deals with beavers and they come in and they assess the situation. In some cases, we're able to install what's called a beaver deceiver that essentially routes water underneath the beaver dam, but the beavers don't realize it. And I can show you a, a, a graphic of this, but the, the water has to be at least, I think it's five feet deep. And this area right here is not that deep. So they can't put a beaver deceiver in. And so what we ended up doing is we rerouted this blue trail right up here, higher up to this green and brown trail because this became completely flooded. Now, if you went out there today, it's probably dry and it probably isn't a problem, but on most days that is now a marsh because of the beavers. And so obviously that's problematic. Uh, 
there are rules though with the beavers. You, you, you cannot relocate beavers in Massachusetts. And so really the options are adapt to the beavers, which is, like I said, we rerouted the trail. We've closed that blue trail off and we routed, routed it to higher ground. Um, or you have to kill the beavers. And I don't think anyone is in favor of that. So we've had multiple community sessions to talk about this. What they've done recently as sort of a middle ground is they had DPW come in and they can get back there. This is a, a, a road that they can get their trucks back in and they breach that beaver dam. And they've breached it at least three or four times. And the good news, bad news is it appears as if the beavers at that location have moved on, but now they're at a culvert um, in a different location downstream. So we're continuing to monitor this. Um, it, is a, it is a bit of a problem. Um, when it starts affecting Route 9, that's when things might s turn more serious because if there's flooding to Route 9 or anything like that, that's obviously gonna cause a problem. So Claire Rundelli and this outside um, group monitors the situation. DPW does have the ability when called on to breach that dam. Um, that said, it's become a bit of a tourist attraction. People go there and watch it, it, and sometimes they'll see the beavers at work. And normally what happens is the beavers we, we will breach that dam and the next day it's already partially rebuilt and by two, three days later, it's completely rebuilt. So it does make you question how effective the breaching of the dam is. That said, we've at least frustrated them enough to move on to a different location and now that'll probably present another problem for us. But it's a continual problem that we're monitoring. This isn't the only parcel. I'll talk about Pickerel Pond next. That's another parcel that's got beavers, but we were able to put the beaver deceivers there and we've mitigated um, that issue. And then lastly, there's a meadow restoration going on. So for those of you who don't know, this here where it says Black Eyed Susan is a, or was, and soon to be a meadow. So it was a meadow back, let me show you a picture here. This is, um, this is a picture from 1952 of the meadow, Town Forest Meadow. This is 2015. And in 20, I think it was 2018, the CONCOM had a, they prioritized restoring this meadow for biodiversity. And so they had someone come in with huge machinery and essentially take out all these trees and blast wood chips, the wood chips that were created all over the ground. And the issue with that was, it was great that it got rid of the trees and, and a lot of the invasives, but the wood chips were so big that nothing could come up underneath it other than the invasive species. And so it looked almost like a moonscape with like straggly invasive species coming up and that certainly wasn't the intention. So this has been on our priority list for a couple years now. There's a guy on our committee named uh, Jim Franzreb who is who owns this initiative and has done a huge amount of work, multiple Eagle Scout projects, multiple volunteer days um, to get this back to its original state. This is what you see here is, and this isn't even updated because we've been out there the last three weekends doing more than this. This is the only section, the section that says not cleared that we are still working on. Everything else has been cleared and it's, we, we threw out, um, we threw down some seed. It's a mix of um, various meadow sort of vegetation um, out there. Unfortunately, it's been dry, very dry since we did this. It would be nice if it rained here uh, in a couple of days, hopefully. But um, our intention, obviously, is to get this back to 
a true meadow. And I think people are excited about that. Um, and again, we have a sort of a separate group that's just working on the meadow restoration of that. Let me take you to Pickerel Pond now. So how many people, well, actually, let me see. Let me, I can't see the, um, the hand uh, raise button. Um, if you see that down by, uh, what's it say, Nikki? The um, reactions, is that what it says? I'm in presentation mode, it's hard to see. Is that right. how you write? So it, it could be uh, under the participants box that people have. There's um, three ellipses uh, that might give you options. There's a reactions button that might give you options. Um, a smiley yeah. face button that yeah gave... yeah exactly whatever you want to pick uh, <laughs> depends on your device <laughs> exactly how many people by a show of hands or smiley faces or whatever have been to pickerel pond okay we got a few we got a few pickerel pond people but i bet there's a lot more yeah. than the, the town forest um yeah so also, I, I figured this would be about uh, about right and, and the reason i ask is because a lot of times we sit out at natick days we sit out at um earth day at these booths and people come up and they talk to us and one of the most common questions is is like where should i go like what's the spot that i should go to that i haven't been to and my first answer is pickerel pond it's one of my favorite places in natick we're doing a lot of work there. I think it'll be even better. And if we get some grant funding, it's gonna be amazing. So the first thing to call out is, as I mentioned before, the beaver deceivers. Um, there's a beaver deceiver, let me show you. It is um, right over here. And there's even, there's an interpretive sign. It's not this sign, but it's one just like it. This is also there, uh, and this is the, the beaver dam at Pickerel Pond as well. Uh, these were put in a couple of years ago um, to show people and, and to get them interested in the beavers. Um, the beaver deceiver there actually is working, and so it's actually nice. You can look at a beaver dam and not have to deal with flooded trails or anything like that. So that's definitely a positive. Um, the two big projects that we are hopeful to complete um, in the near future is there is a small inlet right here that has, the, the kids have figured out that this island overlook is the spot. And I can confirm that this is one of the nicest spots in Natick. The problem is you have to get over this little stream. And as of right now, there's a ping pong table, it looks like, that has uh, been used as a bridge for the kids to get over there. Um, we have the materials, we're ready to build a proper bridge to get across that stream. Um, we're working with, with Claire and the CONCOM to do that. And then once that's completed, we'll have better access to this island overlook. It's a beautiful spot, you can't hear cars. Um, Pickerel Pond is somewhat unique in that it's got the Atlantic white cedar trees in that area. And if you know trees, um, that is one that people seek out. Um, and so this is a great, this will make this much better. The other project, and this is a bigger project, and we'll talk about the CPA in a second here, but our hope is to get grant funding to have a boardwalk that will connect this South Overlook to what we call South Pickerel Pond uh, area. So there's a little, this is more of a neighborhood type trail right now. There's a few things to do, it's not very long, but the intention is to connect these two. And that's a long span there, that's 150 feet probably. Um, and so it's an expensive project. Claire has been great. There's, there's some momentum right now that we might be, um, close to securing grant funding for that. And so I think um, that would open up this trail system to all of the people living here and expand it for all the people living over here. So this is to me a big deal. 
Um, one of the issues is just the, the parking. People are confused where to park to get here. So, you know, we're trying to figure out this, if you've been to Huron Drive, it, it's a little odd. It looks like you're walking into a driveway of a business to get to the trailhead. So we're trying to figure out a better way to do that. There's also an entrance over here on Erie Drive that we've got some signage for as well that you can get to. But um, if you haven't been there, I would highly recommend it. And especially after we get done with this summer and hopefully we'll have uh, a couple bridges to uh, make it even nicer. And then lastly, I was gonna talk about the future trails wish list. So for all of those on here who have who voted for the Community Preservation Act. I thank you because this is the type of thing that makes people like me dream like bigger than we could dream before because that funding, if you don't know, um, is reserved for specific purposes. And one of those purposes is open space and recreation. In fact, at least 10% of the annual revenue needs to be spent on open space and and open space and recreation. So this is a big deal because a lot of the time we have things that we want to do, but it, you know, it, it, this is, there are economic <laughs> reasons why that might not be possible. And so to have a slice of that set aside in that Community Preservation Act is a huge deal for us and it might enable some of the things that we're talking about. And so one of them, I just mentioned the first one is that boardwalk. The grants normally will fund a percentage. They won't fund the entire thing. So the towns have to come up with the other amount of money. This is something where the CPA could potentially come into play. The next two are two things that we're passionate about. And this is making certain trails accessible, ADA accessible. And so we're hopeful that, and it's probably an either or, Town Forest, that, that strip that I mentioned a couple of times from Oak Street is nice and flat already. So it wouldn't be hard to do. It's already a road. And then if you've been to Pegan Cove, the entrance from the trailhead into Pegan Cove is also very flat. The hope is to build an accessible path and then if it's done at the town forest an overlook into that essentially that area where the beaver is. And so it would make, it would open up both of those parcels to people who can't normally get there. We've been in conversations with um, accessibility advocates um, to, to get that moving. The problem is it's expensive, you know? And so this is another thing that we could propose for the um, CPA funds. And then lastly, and with the historical twist, and this is something that Terry uh, cer uh, certainly knows about and has been uh, helpful with, is if you don't know, across from the dog park, there is a trail, it's the Henry Wilson Trail, and you can follow it all the way up to Henry Wilson's grave. And it our hope is to, to create historical markers along that trail that talk about Henry Wilson and his contributions to Natick, to the US government, the history behind Henry Wilson as you walk to his grave site. And so, as I understand it, we already have the, the, the language created for those, that signage. We just need the funding to be um, able to do that. So I think that's probably of all of these, the least expensive option on this list and something that's probably um, certainly very doable in the near future, but it's certainly our hope to, to do that. I think there's a lot of people go to the dog park and they don't realize that just right across the street, there's a whole trail system. In fact, you don't even have to go across the street. Middlesex path parallels 135 there as well, and we'll take you into Natick Center. So um, making sure that people understand when they come and visit the dog park that they they appreciate the trails that we've got here in Natick. That's it for my formal presentation. Um, I did want to leave you with some contact information though. So I, I'm reachable at Natick Trails at gmail.com, as you see here. I post and some of the group posts on the open space 
group um, on Facebook. Uh, or if you're on Instagram and you want to follow us at Natick Trails, um, that's certainly a way to keep in touch. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, like I said, send me an email, send me some a message on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, I will connect you with the right people. We want to make sure that your voices are heard and we're always looking for opinions of the community. So feel free to send me an email, uh, a direct message, anything, um, whatever is easiest for you. So with that, I will turn it uh, over to Nikki for, uh, for questions. Great, thank you so much, Doug. That was fantastic. And um, I'm just thrilled to hear about all the incredible projects that are in pursuit or being uh, hoped for and planned for. Um, so congratulations on all this exciting work. It's yeah, fabulous. Thank you. Um, and so a warm but silent Zoom round of applause for Doug and uh, and a thanks to all of you. And I think we'll open it up at this point for questions. Um, so again, find that um, that speaker bubble for the for the chat uh, function. Um, also, please feel free to raise your hand um, and I will be on the lookout for you um, if you'd like to ask your question live. Um, we do have, a, we have um, one question that came in and, and um, Catherine, I see you too. So let me get started here, Doug. Um, uh, how were the trails established? Do you have a sense? We 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 got the the note on the history of uh, Honeywell Town Forest, but do you have a, a sense of kind of the rest of the trail system and how they were established? About when? Any historical context on that? Yeah, you know what? I I am not the uh, historian of the group for sure. Uh, some of you may know Martin Kessel. He can spin the history of every trail in Natick. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to ask that question. Town Forest is obviously, like as I said, it was established a long time ago, and 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 those trails were really neighborhood trails that just formed over time. And, and some of the issues we have with Town Forest is sort of redirecting people because it gets confusing when people make shortcuts all over and then they don't understand what's the trail and what's not the trail and all of that. But um, over the course of time, certainly Natick has a long history of um, with the trails. The other thing too is some of the trails like the Middlesex path is where the railroad used to go down and they moved the railroad. And so then that left the opportunity to build a trail right there. So some of the, some of the parcels I certainly know better, but um, th that's about the best I can do for you. Well, that's great. That tells me that there's a project awaiting us about the history <laughs> of sort of open space and trail establishment uh, in Natick because it would be a lovely story to tell. And I think increasing numbers of opportunities to, to tell it. Um, and uh, so Catherine, go ahead because I saw your hand. Yes. Um, the water tower in the Natick Town Forest, I've been up there a number of times over the years. It's covered with graffiti. Is it still in use? Is it still what? Is it still in use? Oh, yeah. No, it's still in use. And, and, and I, th that graffiti drives me nuts, too, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I think there's a fear of if we paint it, will they just re re do it all over again? Uh, you know what I mean? Has it become like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Doug Pond area and they have that one sort of cement wall and it's sort of a senior, uh, I think it's a senior thing. My son's in high school, I should probably know this better, but uh, where they paint over it, like with the class, you know what I mean? And it's sort of a thing. And I don't know if that was how that all happened back in the day, but it certainly is an eyesore for sure. Does it supply water to a certain area in Natick? That, that I don't know. I, I, I couldn't speak to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the chat here, and I see another hand, but let me go um, back to the chat. I did want to note that someone wrote in to say that there's a Lilja teacher who still brings uh, her class to the town forest every month, um, which is which is lovely to hear. Um, and I have a question here about um, uh, trees and uh, the junction numbers. How are they attached to the trees so that they don't um, harm the cambium layer of the tree. Can you speak to that process? Yeah. So if, if you so you need to leave the the nail 
far enough out. It's, it's a nail is what it is. Um, so, but the, the nail has to be out far enough so that it allows for growth in the tree. Um, and so the, the team that's working with this, this has been reviewed with them as far as ensuring that that's not going to damage the tree. And we've been assured that that will not be the case. So that's how they're, uh, that's how they're attached. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, I imagine it's probably helpful to have a botanist and an arborist and a, a few folks like that among volunteers. And um, right. Usually helpful, for sure. Yeah. It, it's yeah. a learning experience for me every time I go out with her. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and Lydia, I want to turn it over to you uh, to, to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. I, I think I've seen one of these beaver deceivers uh, on the, the uh, uh, boardwalk that goes um, from uh, Bradford into... Yes. Okay. That's where it so, is, yeah. How does that work? We always wondered what it was when we were walking along. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, like I said, there is a whole a company that this is their thing. It, you know what I mean? And, and I don't know if they coined the phrase beaver deceiver. I have no idea. It's a catchy phrase, though, I will say. So <laughs> I think uh, at that, um, that company, if so, essentially, so what you'll see, and it's, if you ever stop and look at that sign, it, it's, it, it has a, a diagram and I'm on my work computer or else I would be able to pull it up real quick, but, and I, so I can't, but um, it has a diagram of it on that informational sign there. But essentially what it does is there's two sort of like, it looks like a cage sort of yeah. on both sides of the beaver dam. And then there's a tube that runs underneath it yeah. and to the other cage. And essentially what it's doing is it's tricking the beavers into thinking that it's it's damned when it's really not. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that's that's the trick is if they if they feel or hear or sense running water, that 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 they will continue to plug it up. And this somehow bypasses their ability to detect that running water and runs underneath it. But like I said, it has to be a certain depth that that river and that happens to be uh, deep enough, whereas at Town Forest, unfortunately, it's not deep enough. And so that's really the only non-lethal option that we've got. And so that's what makes this a tricky, um, a tricky right. situation. And also, where's the dog park? Because <laughs> you're talking about the Wilson. And I went, well, I don't know where the dog park is. <laughs> <It's wrong laughs> I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't assume that either. So it's by... Um, it's on 135, uh, close to Fisk Pond. It's right. It's right across from Fisk Pond. Is that a VFW? Or is it, does anybody know? Yes. Like, uh, okay. Um, there's a VFW, I think, right there next to it, and there's a parking lot. It's called Eddie's Park. Um, it was open probably three, four years ago, maybe at this point. Um, I have a dog. It's a popular place for sure. Um, and so, it draw, and I think it draws a lot of non-Natic residents there too. So I think it's a good opportunity to highlight the trails. Like we literally have two trails right off that dog park. So um, it's a nice opportunity for them to see Natick. So they're labeled those dog park. I mean, not the dog park, the trails. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. They're labeled. Yeah, there's a kiosk at one for Middlesex Path. And then if you go across the street, there's a smaller sign. We have we don't have a kiosk at the one across the street, which is the Henry Wilson one. But if you go across the street and you follow that trail all the way up, it'll dead end you into the um, is that the Dell Cemetery? I think it's the Dell Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then you can sort of work your way to Henry Wilson's grave, which if you haven't been there. It's no. actually a little strange because you would, everyone, including myself, thought it was like the big, you know, marker. You know, there's a big marker, and it's real. It's not. It's it's like a teeny marker right next. I think that might be his wife or something. I don't know. Like, but someone related <laughs> to that. Uh, someone on this call probably knows better than I do. But um, but again, it's um, it's a nice walk from there. It's not far at all. How, how how wide are the trails? I'm always worried about ticks. 
Uh, believe me, I, we have Lyme disease in my house. And so I am spraying all the time with For everything me. I can. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the stuff um, to put on. That's what I have on my outfits and all of that. We try to make them four feet wide is the answer. Okay. So, so essentially two people should be able to walk side by side with each other on the trail. There are certain spots, obviously, that make it impossible to maintain that, but right. four feet is our object, at least four feet is our objective for that. No, thank you very much. Great presentation. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> thank you, Lydia. And I've got a few more questions here. Um, uh, Doug, where can people get information to help them identify invasive species? It's a great question. Um, I think, and I'll have to confirm this, but um, that there is some information out on the town website that has um, our, our most common invasive species out there. Um, and if not, what I'll do is I can work with Claire to get something up there. The ones that we see the most often, Japanese knotweed, if you don't know, it, it is, it will grow a foot in a day. So mm -hmm. it, it's ridiculous. Um, bittersweet, uh, we had an Eagle Scout project that was uh, removing Aurelia from town forest last year. Um, some others, but those are the, those are the main. Um, uh, mustard garlic. Mustard garlic, yeah, it, it it's it's amazing. Like I went in as a complete novice at this, and when they start pointing this stuff out, like I said, I, I become obsessed with uh, trying to remove it. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to remove it in, without using pesticides, and and obviously that can be tricky because it, you know even when you're pulling things up, sometimes you're disrupting. The soil and then that um, creates more invasives coming out because it brings stuff up from the from deeper in the, uh, in the ground so it's uh it's a tricky problem for sure thank you um and i think oh uh let me um terry is this a follow-up question to that no oh okay um well go go ahead and then i've got another question in the wings here Go ahead. It was it was actually just to answer Doug's um, uh, question about Henry Wilson's grave because <laughs> you <laughs> knew it. Um, and that is his son. His son was his son died in the Civil War, serving in the Union Army, and so a grieving Henry Wilson and his wife created the very significant memorial there. Uh, and so, what's his name, Terry? Uh, I knew you, you were going to ask me that. I can't tell you right <laughs> offhand. But um, okay. but that but it's was right next, it's right in that area though, right? Yeah. So yeah. So it was. It, it is. It's right. Truly, right next to him. And okay. it was, you know, a grieving parents. Um, I think it was their only child. No, if I'm not mistaken. So that was. A, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, and I know Terry joins me in this. The historical society is very eager to partner on something like that to, to help get Wilson's story out there. Um, a great question here, a couple of questions about this. Are your trail maps available online and where can somebody get more information about Natix Trail Systems? Uh, the town website. The, we just updated the trails, the trail maps, I should say, and they're all posted. So all of the major trails. So there are some footpaths, we'll call them, that, that we don't yeah. manage. But the major trails, there's probably 10 of them that we manage, all have maps out on the town uh, website. They were just refreshed this year. Um, I will say they don't yet have the junction numbers that we talked about a little earlier. That's the right. next step. But they do have, um, they align now with all of the, the coloring on the trails, the sort of directional uh, coloring. Um, so those are definitely available on the town website. That's great. And a very specific question here. Do any of those trails connect to the aqueducts in South Natick? Yes. Yes, they do. Okay. Um, so the Eisenmanger Trail will run from Natick Center all the way down to right behind Memorial School. And if you don't know, right behind Memorial School is um, the Sudbury Aqueduct. So a lot of people will ride their bikes down there 
and then ride the aqueduct out to Cottage Street and then do a big loop like that. So um, we, we have that right. also at Pickerel Pond, if you walk across Oak Street, which look both ways, it's a tricky crossing, but uh, <laughs> is the is the Kachichuit Aqueduct and that will take you all the way okay. into Wells. So there's a couple connectivity um, connections with the aqueducts and our trails for sure. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, thank you. And I think one final question, it's a personal one. Can you say what is the 4,000 footer club? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the 4,000 footer club. So if you don't know, New Hampshire uh, is famous for there's 48 peaks above 4,000 feet in New Hampshire. And so what people do is they try to hike them all. And when you hike them all, you get in the 4,000 foot club. So uh, <laughs> my friend and I have been doing this since uh, we probably took us 15 years, probably to get all of them. Um, but we finally accomplished that uh, probably five, six years ago. And so um, when you're in the 4,000 foot club, that just means you've hiked every peak above 4,000 feet in New Hampshire. Wow, what an incredible feat. Yes, I'm seeing some applause here. Um, so congratulations to you, Doug, and uh, congratulations on all the incredible work that's going on uh, in Natick on um, the trail system. It's it's really exciting and um, I'm delighted to know more about it and excited for the future of Natick trails and, and forest, uh, the town forest too. Um, yeah. keep, keep us all in touch with your wonderful projects. And, uh, I think I'm seeing some thanks coming into the chat here. Um, many thanks to, to, to you, Doug, and to all of you for, uh, for being here, uh, to hear about, uh, about Natick's Trails and Forests. Um, it's awesome. been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Doug.